All right. So today, some of you can see on the slide, we have Ross Sozzini. Uh, she's a professor at uh, NC State. She is uh, very accomplished. She's got an NSF Career Award. She runs the STEPS, which is the what is Science and Technology for Phosphorus Sustainability, uh, as part of an NC, uh, NSF uh, STC, which she'll talk a little bit about. She's the director uh, for plant improvement at NC State. Um, yes, uh, so I will let her talk about all those things. Um, and yeah, please. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me here. I feel honored after three years. And thank you, Amir. There was a long of. Uh, a long history among uh, Chris and Amir. We have been meeting always online. I think Amir and Chris, uh, one time. So thank you and thank you for taking the time. Uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, I would say three aspects. One that is specifically the research ongoing in my group, and then how also we uh, have participated uh, with a fantastic collaborator into an STC and then the North Carolina Free Science Initiative. And so the title that uh, I like is uh, to say the Goldilocks principle of just the right amount of growth. And so one would ask uh, why is it important to, to look at the right amount of growth? And so what you're going to see here on the right side is the golden circle, the why, the how, and the what. And so the motivation is the why, the why to study the right growth, uh, um, the right amount of growth, and is because growth is a major component of fitness in all organisms, but in plants is a key determinant for crop yields. And so if you were to say what well, crop yields, the motivation is you want to study growth and development so that you can predict what is going to be the crop yield. And so that is one of the threading elements, for example, of my research, the STEP Center and uh, the Plant Science Initiative. And so we all know, I think you're all plant uh, scientists, some related to research done in plants. So I don't have to tell you how uh, plants are the irreplaceable food resources and how we need to uh, the kind of like running estimate. We need more food. We have less uh, arable land and uh, we don't want to arm the environment and specifically on the arm the environment is where the Science and Technology Center for Phosphorus Sustainability Plan comes in place. So the the owl and I'm going to show you also how we're doing the how in my group um, to feed more people. So the motivation to feed more people. There has to be uh, innovation in technology. So the, the, the understanding here is what is the process? The process has to be that the fundamental science, the technology that we develop in my group in steps in the PSI is a use inspire research. So is motivated by an end user. So to help say farmers and growers. And uh, here was in, um, I can say that, but Bill Gates said, says it and is more impactful uh, in Bill Gates foundation letters. It says that crop yields. So the growth and the development that we predict for crop yields, crop yields are no longer keeping pace with the population growth, and we need to prioritize agricultural innovation. And the agricultural innovation that you're going to see throughout the talk today is based on uh, quantitative uh, biology and engineering. So a lot of uh, omics and a lot of uh, genetics, genomics, uh, a lot of modeling so that we can develop new technology. And I'm going to show you an example of what kind of technology so that we can apply so this technology and so that uh, uh, it can be adopted by users. And so um, in terms of what is the growth and what is the development, so the what, so the product, what we can think about growth and development is practically that is the growth equal the increase in plant mass over time. And these uh, growth rate is affected by mainly uh, what you're seeing up there, uh, internal factors. So how genes, molecular communication, 
cell to cell communication, tissue communication, physiology, and then uh, how the growth rate variation is affected by external factors. You can imagine abiotic and biotic factors. Um, and so my group, STEPS, the PSI, are underlying this need of incorporating all of these layer of information through a kind of like holistic view of growth at the plant level um, and, and incorporate uh, all of these quantitative data and the physiological data and the developmental data. And so uh, for a system level understanding, what you're going to see today is really the uh, merging together of multiple, as we're all doing in this room, multiple disciplines from the genetics, the physiology, the physics, the imaging, and the modeling. And practically four, these one, two, three, four bullet points are the why they have been driven my attention in the space of plant science and plant growth. And so, for example, one important question in terms of related to stem cell regulation in plant is how plants initiate and maintain the growth, or also how do cells communicate and they interface with the environment, and et cetera. And so these one, two, three, four will kind of like be the outline of uh, today's uh, talk. And so at the very beginning, I'll tell you the how we uh, use quantitative data and then we develop a uh, model for this quantitative data to provide some information on the underlying dynamics of communication and cellular regulation and how we can use this model to predict something. Importantly, for example, the causal relationship that happens uh, at the different layers of regulation. And then I'll tell you more on things that are maybe less, um, I would say, basic science, but more on the translation to practice in terms of the translation of the knowledge. And so this is uh, the what, um, and this is, uh, I would say, a forever um, favorite of mine, where you're looking on the left side is uh, a confocal images of an Arabidopsis root. And here, how you see color coded is where the stem cells of these uh, plant roots are. They are in a stem cell niche and about uh, 2010, uh, 2011, when I started to work on my own group, we only had a handful regulator of stem cell maintenance and stem cell identity and growth. And so um, leveraging on some of the feature, the reduced complexity in terms of uh, growth and development, where for growth and development, you need to look at spatial and temporal dynamics. We use the Arabidopsis root because there is a reduction in the three dimension of the root in a two dimension because there is radial symmetry of the root. And then for what it considered the time, we can collapse the fourth dimension that is time along the longitudinal axis of the root because you have the, the stem cells divide and they generate um, their daughter cells that then because of cell walls are then displaced higher up such that the older cells are at the farther away from the tip of the root. So with that in mind, we said, well, we have a lot of uh, fluorescent marker. Could we look specifically at the gene expression profile in all of these different stem cells and along a temporal uh, gradient? And so with that, there is a series of uh, publication. I'm not going to go much into the details, but what we could clearly see was a uh, my postdoc uh, proving that I was not crazy, that much crazy. Let's rephrase that. Where we have that uh, the working hypothesis was you. Uh, the working hypothesis was that uh, the transcriptomic profile, so the gene expression of the stem cell niche was separated or distinct from the transcriptomic profile of the remaining of the plant root because those are at different developmental stages. And so by profiling all of the different stem cells, what you're seeing here, and I have to tell you another story. My, my group is very uh, 
is an hybrid group. Hybrid now here, you 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 may have people present or not. That's still true in my group. They are present in the lab or they are even from Belgium. Uh, but it's hybrid because we have biologists and computational uh, electrical computer engineers and computer scientists. And so my very first postdoc, Angels de Luis Balaguer, she was a electrical computer engineer and she presented me with this and I look and I said, huh, I didn't think we were working on Drosophila embryo. Because if you're looking at this, is the typical Im images that you can see from an in situ of a Drosophila embryo where you have a ventral dorsal gradient. And then she looked at me and she's like, well, still model plan, but this is actually your Arabidopsis. What she proceeded to tell me and uh, train me as an electrical computer engineer was to show me that there is a, a principal component analysis looking at all the genes that are from the stem cell versus the genes that are not in the stem cell, proving that I was not as much crazy, learning a little bit more about uh, uh, PCA and importantly, setting up that uh, indeed there is a transcriptional profile of the stem cell that is different from the non-stem cell. And then uh, we had uh, uh, other publications showing that there is actually now a gradient. And this is important because now we're gonna leverage this information for when I'm presenting you, for example, the 3D bioprinting research that we're doing now. So there is a gradient of stemness. It's not that the stem cell is a stem cell that it divides and it loses the capability and the competence to regenerate and divide. It remains lingering around with this capability for a certain length. Uh, uh, and this length is provided by opposite gradient that we know that there are transcription factor and hormone like Arabidopsis that create these uh, um, stemness gradient. Uh, at the same time, what we did, we profile all of the different stem cells at different time point because we wanted to know what were really the dynamics in this uh, uh, system. And so now we have, yeah, go ahead. Oh yes, please. Make sure that I understand the following slide. In the previous slide, you had three stages. Yes. Uh, I just want to make sure if those stages, you mean the zones of the root or? The Correct. Okay, good. Okay. And that gives me the possibility to go more into the details. Thank you, Mayor. So what you're seeing here is stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, a fantastic uh, former team member when I was a postdoc, Ken Bernabal was the one that says, well, uh, based on the morphology of the cells, it is hypothesized that there is a transamplifying region here where the cells continue to divide. Stage two is when the cell starts to elongate and they stop to divide, and stage three is when they start to differentiate. And so that is what is the developmental gradient along the longitudinal axis of the root. And so with that in mind, what we did we dissected the root in an even finer way. We also used different marker line at different uh, developmental stages so that we had both spatial and temporal data, which now you can look at a technology like uh, spatial cartography and you can get uh, this information on a spatial cartography. However, if you don't have information about the genes, uh, that is where we were kind of like building in terms of we can now do single cell gene expression and be able to cluster all the different uh, cell type thank you to this prior data. So I feel old, but I feel you useful rather than useless. But so having said that, and this was only 2018 and 2019, uh, we provided the whole root of Arabidopsis together with um, Philip Banfi, the root and, and Schwann Brady, the whole root of Rabidopsis uh, stem cell network. Now, these are very quantitative data. You have a lot of gene expression. It can be RNA-seq, now is single cell. So how you're going to use this uh, information to build, say, modeling. And so what we did, we started to use, based on the quality of the data that we have, develop new algorithm to make some causal relationship prediction. And so what you're seeing here is the two examples that we put together. And again, 
in, uh, I would say, 2016, we went with a probabilistic model that is a dynamic vision network. Just a year later, we're moving to machine learning so to show how fast is the space. Now, we use machine learning, but we actually do mostly neural networks, so very fast um, evolving. But here is to show the example of if you have time course data, there are out there um, um, models that allow you to predict the causal relationship of genes. So you can say, well, what is, for example, the gene that is important for the maintenance of the quiescent center versus other um, uh, cell type? And so you can go more into the details. I'm not spending time here because, again, 2016, we have uh, moved faster in the direction of, for example, machine learning. Now what you can do is to really use um, an unsupervised approach that is a regression tree with a random forest to identify given uh, what are your cell type, what are the genes that, that you are interested in, identify what are the gene regulatory network and learn something about that. So for example, from these uh publication we had in 2019 uh, it showed that of the 3000 genes that are stem cell specific 70 percent are ubiquitously expressed in all the stem cell and the other 30 percent the blue one there are specific to different stem cell suggesting that there are regulatory networks that are important for the identity of that stem cell and the 70% of the other genes that are part of the red network are important for the maintenance. And so then you can dig in more, more into what are the dynamics of these 70%. So for example, what we looked into and what we found was the um, orchestra director. So if you're looking at the stem cell niche are different population of cells, cells, and they need to all divide coordinately so that the root grows and it grows with the right growth. Um, what we look into was of the 70% of ubiquitously expressed genes, what made them so particular and so important in the stem cell? And so we identify these uh, TCX2 genes is a so like uh, gene involving the dream complex, so in the cell cycle regulation. And what we saw is that it was ubiquitously expressed, so present, not in terms of level, but present across the different, say, 10 different stem cells. We knew how it controlled in this regulatory network, the downstream genes and color coded here with the different colors are the different cell types. So for example, TCX2 control these uh, sombrero genes in the epidermis, but it also controls these uh, revoluta genes in the xylem. So we know that these are specific cell type genes, but a ubiquitously expressed stem cell maintenance genes is controlling them. And how they control them is at the protein level. At the protein level, what you're seeing is that it is always expressed, but you can have a higher accumulation or a lower accumulation of the protein. So a certain threshold by which following this threshold, it can either regulate one cell type versus another, and the level is matching with the rate of division. And so what we could do is we could track over time, the protein accumulation of this gene and predict and have a model that would predict the level and the intensity of these uh, transcription factor and how it regulates the downstream target. So with this large data, we went into the molecular mechanism of how this CCX2 is actually um, regulating and coordinate all of the different stem cell division. At the same time, what we did, we elevated the uh, prediction into 
identify when a stem cell divides. And so the, here we are talking about cell cell communication, how a, cell, a stem cell divide and how that division affect the secondary stem cell. Because again, there is a whole communication of, uh, among cells. And what we realized was that it was not only the level of protein in that cells that would set the threshold to either say, you're on genes and now you need to divide the stem cell, but it was actually the protein stoichiometry. And so we developed these uh, uh, fluorescent correlation spectroscopy technique. Uh, it's called number and brightness that allows you when you have two uh, protein labeled with two different fluorophore, you look at their uh, oligomeric state. And now you can put these oligomeric state in your model and you can predict whether it is a two to one stoichiometry that leads to a delay in division versus a uh, two to four that allows for a fast uh, division. And so all of these um, division in the stem cell are due to the gene being expressed in the same domain, the genes that are not expressed in the same domain, but they have the capability of identity. So to monitor and what is the surrounding and tell exactly the cell given a signal when to divide and also to coordinate it with all the other stem cells because again coordination and the just growth is important so that you have a non-apparent uh, root. We took these to the next level we got all the information of every single cell at the transcriptomic level as well as uh, protein-protein interaction, as well as uh, uh, through live sheet microscopy and uh, an, an imaging capability that we develop, we follow the division rate so that we could, from a molecular model, scale to the next level. So go to a multi-scale model and use an agent-based model where we would put together all the information of the molecules, as well as uh, the information about the cells and how they divide so that our models now can predict given specific parameter whether cells will divide and how the tissue will form. Why this is important is because you now can use single cell gene expression without information from where these uh, cells are coming from and put it all in these uh, mathematical models so that you can predict whether uh, that gene or that cluster of gene is causal for that cells to divide or not. And so this is uh, where is the um, conversion that we did from uh, the RNA-seq bulk uh, expression for us activating cell sorting to the single cell. And so what we did, why is important is, for example, uh, our work with Terry and Hoka showed us how we could predict that specifically a phloem. Um, so in the Arabidopsis root, uh, the phloem is important for uh, the transport of nutrient. And what we know is that there is an end stage differentiation. And this end stage differentiation is about 25 cells after the first stem cell uh, divide to so generate a daughter cells. After 25 cells, you have an end stage differentiation that is um, the loss of the nuclei. So you have this enucleation process, and how this enucleation process is important to have within a specific window of time. So it's not only the coordination, but it's exactly how the cells uh, uh, should be entering the competence level in terms of losing the nuclei. And it's important to have these uh, right time of the nucleation because at that time, then the, the cells becomes fully functional. And you can have similar to a red blood cells. You can imagine that you can have a very effective transport of your oxygen and CO2. And in this case, in the phloem is exactly the same. If you delay the of just a couple of cells, the nucleation of phloem cells, 
you have that the plants now are having downstream effect in terms of their physiology and performance and fitness. And so what we saw is that this enucleation process takes about 60 hours. And similar to, and so Terry is an expert in iron deficiency. And so to test whether our single cell gene expression and model would predict that if you change the 60 hour um, window, whether you have any negative effect, what we did, we leveraged from red blood cells grown in cell culture without iron where you have a stunted and a delayed differentiation of red blood cells and uh, you have serious problem. We all know, for example, we need iron in our diet and so are the plants. If you were to put now these uh, uh, plants into iron starvation, iron deficiency, what you're having is that you have a delay of just two cells in this uh, enucleation and the plants becomes to be chlorotic, the plant uh, is, uh, um, has cells that are shorter, so you have a lot of uh, downstream effect just by setting up these at 25 cells, which is 60 hours. So, um, and so what we're trying to identify is now the regulatory network that controls the enucleation independently, for example, of the supply of iron so that you can now have plants that are uh, edited for these genes and they are resistant to iron deficiency so that you don't have, for example, your soybean that are chlorotic in absence of iron. And so this is just to tell you that the right growth, the spatial temporal uh, progression of stem cell is what sets up the competency and the gain and the fitness of the whole plant from the very beginning. Of course, you may have then other effects like drought and uh, abiotic biotic stress, but the very beginning comes with if you have the right um, competency of the stem cell niche to set up the right uh, uh, strategy and fitness. With that, that is practically the lesson learned. In the meantime, we learn a lot in terms of stoichiometry matters in our models and how uh, for these molecular mechanism, knowing the stoichiometry, it may be very important and not only the gene expression and the protein level. Um, what, we, what we learned was really to the importance of these gradients and how by affecting just for a few hours, and imagine two cells, that means that is 12 hours difference, just for half of a day can make a difference in a plant fitness. And then we put all of this mathematical model in graphical user interface so that people will use them. And so we, what, we, what we did uh, in these uh, five years, uh, up to 2019, then 2021, we practically um, set up a system so that we could now test the question related to, well, if that is true, what if you take away a stem cell? What happened to that plant? What if you put now more stem cell, do you gain more fitness? And knowing what are all of these quantitative data telling us, how many of the stem cell you can put and uh, can you actually affect the gradient? So can you actually now manipulate and make a plant grow without say any genetic modification, but with the uh, composition, with the starting material of different stem cells? And so with that, um, this has not yet been proved. Uh, so I'm still in the crazy mode. Uh, none of my postdoc has proven me right or wrong, but practically what we did in this case, um, we took all of our data, all of the single data, all of the models that you can imagine, all of the data that we have quantified so far. We also have images of all of these stem cells. So here are a cartoon of the stem cell. Here is uh, the model of the stem cell. What we do is to also look at the numbers of cells, when they divide, what is their distance? And our model shows that 
in this case, uh, if those are two quiescent centers, those are uh, cortex endodermis initial, those are xylem cells. Um, the dark red, the, the dark black tells me that if I were to put two extra stem cells there, they will differentiate. They will not say um, undifferentiated, but then if we run the model and we change, for example, the numbers of quiescent center, then we get a stem cell niche, an artificial stem cell niche that has more stem cells and the xylem cells are now um, stem cells. So you may think you can, if you regenerate from these artificial stem cells and you plant, that plant may have a, a larger xylem system. Or you can ask question whether if you change the order and the position is a forever developmental question. If you have a positional cue of your cells, if you change, if you take a columella stem cell and you put it in the place of a xylem cell cell, what happened to those cells? The model right now tell us they will change the identity. And so with this mathematical model, now we are put in place to test these hypotheses. How we do it, well, we partner with the mechanical and aerospace engineer, and we now use 3D bioprinting because we can take any cells that we want from Arabidopsis, we can deposit them in a way that uh, is very controlled. Uh, maybe less control with these uh, extrusion uh, 3D bioprinting, but we have now a laser 3D bioprinter that you, you can take a single cell and deposit in the order that you want, you want, let them grow, and then do single cell gene expression and see whether they've changed their identity or maintenance. Uh, in the meantime, what we did, uh, we set up the 3D bioprinting, um, I would say, platform. It was just uh, recently accepted in Science Advanced. But what we do is, for our 3D bioprinting, to get to the point that I want to go, is always the time that you build. So right now, what we do, because it was never used before, we, we don't start from tissue culture. We start from... What we know is the competency of the cells to maintain the capability to divide. And so what we use is shoot apical meristem, root apical meristem, or the root that has the stemness gradient. We take that section. We obtain protoplast from soybean because the seeds are bigger. We take the embryo. And then what we do, we isolate the protoplast from these intact growing tissue that have their capability, competency of dividing, but they also have identity information. And then we 3D bioprint in the bioprinting construct that we want through this microfluidics device so that we can image them over time. We can acquire a lot of information in terms of, and because it was established just recently by us, we had to look at aspect like what is the scaffolding material to use, what is the percentage of viable cells, uh, how many uh, cells, for example, that come from the meristem, so these uh, stemness region versus the non-stemness region, what is the fitness of these and how they're viable, uh, what tissue type is more amenable for 3D bioprinting, and then is the identity of known marker in the right condition uh, uh, maintained. And so, for example, here is a forever marker for cortex uh, and endodermis scarecrow. And so what you're having is a label scarecrow protoplast, and then you follow over time, given the right condition, uh, when it divides and when it starts to form the calli, which one of cells maintain their identity, which tell us uh, is now our um, platform to use and do um, RMPs. Uh, so we don't do tissue culture. <laughs> That's a bad idea. <laughs> we, what we do is uh, we, we use the protoplast and we use RMPs so that you can just do your edit genome and then you can just select the protoplast that have been edited and they are forming microcalli. So from these microcalli that you have the regeneration of your uh, plant uh, that has the right uh, characteristic that you want. So with that in mind, uh, what we did, we 
we did uh, in a Rabidopsis route. So we follow over time the division and then the formation of microcalli. We have about 20% Arabidopsis are not that uh, good of a system, gladly so, because we don't have to really work on regenerating Arabidopsis. But what we saw is that, for example, for soybean, about 90% of the 3D bioprinted cells turn into uh, microcalli. And so what, what we did then was to look at, okay, so if you were to micro dissect, what is the capability of these cells to then, uh, uh, what, what are the key uh, genes or the key composition by which you allow plant to regenerate? Because the bottleneck is transformation and regeneration across the different uh, uh, plant species, especially if you are elite line. So here what we're doing is, we are 3D bioprint, a lot of uh, construct is very high throughput, and then we do gene expression profile. Gene expression profile of all these different uh, uh, 3D bioprinted constructs so that we can look, for example, on a window of three days, what are the genes that are actually now correlating with the re-enter of the cell cycle, and then we can pinpoint based on the regulatory network that we developed five years ago and pinpoint what are the key regulator and what are the mechanisms. So it's kind of like 3D bioprinting and enabling technology built upon all of the five years uh, uh, development tools that we have. Um, so it was anything a surprise, I guess? Of, of the no, but that gives us a, a very important uh, platform. For example, now what we're doing, we take corn recalcitrant line. And then we take uh, um, plant corn uh, that is easy to regenerate. And then we do experiment where we look at uh, the different time point and we see what is the difference in terms of the makeup of the gene expression between the recalcitrants and the, um, and, then, and then what we do, we do editing, adding back uh, some of these genes in the recalcitrant of corn to see whether they start to regenerate. Oh, you, added, you added oxygen directly to protoplast? So you can. So there are different ways. You can use a pre-cocktail that makes the cells very happy. And so the pre-cocktail has oxygen and cytokinin. You can also put no oxygen. So it is really either, uh, you, you can do without and with oxygen. Yeah. What about oxygen inhibitors? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, we have, so what we're trying to do is to figure out what are the mechanism. And so this is also in collaboration with Lucia Strader, um, that is an oxygen uh, person. And so we're trying to figure it out, uh, is it actually the yucca dependent pathway that is the most important branch? is uh, instead the independent pathway so that we need to look more into uh, blocking the transport. Uh, it depends. This is very preliminary. Yeah. And then the very nice part is that we can even uh, uh, use these as a high throughput screening. So now we're using these as a high throughput screening by looking at embryo, somatic embryogenic formation in different uh, uh, chemicals. So those are uh, uh, confidential compounds that we use to uh, treat our 3D bioprinting arrays of cells to see whether, say, a compound that is important for demethylases allows you to have more somatic embryogenesis than others. And so this is a way to also high throughput uh, uh, the screening. And for the step center, what we're using, we're using this system and uh, sensor for phosphorus transport to see whether cells are responding to different speciation of the phosphorus that we put in, into our system in a very fast and reproducible way. And so this is generally what you get. You get these kind of like 3D bioprinted uh, cells that turn into uh, microcalla. You can do a lot of image quantification on the microcalla. You can take the part of the color that has the edited version and move it on. Uh, at the same time, uh, is you can really now learn what are the cell-to-cell -cell 
communication and uh, uh, how you can think to fly to Mars with uh, your plant and then make up another plant on the 3D bioprint. That's. You just don't need potatoes, they just put it in the ground. I know, you can put potato or Arabidopsis. Have you ever tried an Arabidopsis plant? And I don't know what time is it. Oh, okay. So, so with that, um, we, we have uh, established this new platform. Happy to come at any time if you want to collaborate. And so this is all based on this platform is now also merging together with micrografting. And so that comes with a fantastic collaboration with Margaret Franks, um, where we look what are the key important aspects, for example, for tomato, tomato, uh, tomato, pepper, so compatible versus incompatible grafting and identify what are the key. Uh, so this is a Sankey diagram, all of the data that I showed you before, all the gene expression, all of the regulatory network are applied here, but all to say what is the key gene that is important, for example, if you want to reestablish a uh, compatible versus incompatible grafting. So for example, tomato and pepper. And so what, what we found is identifying um, WOX4 as one of the key uh, regulator by comparing all of these grafting, all of these uh, RNA-seq data, and then validate that, for example, WOX4 was the key uh, transcription factor that is important for xylem formation. The other is now adding additional data, Amir, that is not only the transcriptional data, but phosphoproteomic to add layers on the causal relationship and then physiological data. Which so is we have now data where we do G, have different genotype, different phenotype coming from physiological data that are acquired, uh, omics and then treatment. So soybean is the element uh, um, that is recurring here. Uh, and is two treatment in North Carolina is heat, in Belgium is uh, cold. And so how we put all of these data together, both in a graphical user interface, when you have all of these quantitative, uh, for example, phosphoproteomic, all of these is uh, somewhere published now. Uh, either by archive or the nature communication by archive. I'm not sure about where. But again, here is we can do Bayesian network with uh, transcriptomic and phosphoproteomic because we always have a regulator and a downstream uh, target. But we also are now developing these uh, unsupervised learning of autoencoder. So so practically, this is a typical setup for a neural network. And the latest space here in red is where is the black box, is the black box of the neural network. So what we're trying to do is fit into this black box and tell us what are the parameters that we need to use that are important for the model to predict something so that we don't have to do all the transcriptomic, all the phosphoproteomic, all the physiological data. So the latent space will inform us what are the key key parameters that are needed for us. So that uh, it's good to have million dollar grants, but what if you don't have million dollar grants? What are the key data that you need to make a prediction, especially for yield uh, and uh, crop? Knowing that again, there are key elements that are setting up the system for best treatments. This is uh, one of the analytical pipeline that we develop. And the important thing is that now here, and this goes back to your discussion with uh, you, Amir, today, is functional annotation. I come from the world of Arabidopsis where everything is perfectly functional annotated. And then we had to do this neural network where we base on uh, Markov model and, uh, and um, the Hammer uh, prediction that is based on sequence, sequence uh, um, similarity. And so we had to rethink because the sequence similarity is not uh, uh, the only things that is important. For example, a lot of protein now they have 
uh, disorder region. And so the disorder region is adding complexity to the system. So we have now developed this neural network where you can put any sequence of anything and is looking at multiple features, not only the sequence, but is also looking at, uh, I think I have it in the next slide. Oh, no. Um, every five amino acids, how if you make a change, the function of that uh, protein can become a different one so that you do co-functional analysis and they are real fun similar function. And so we did that for soybean, becoming my favorite next, uh, wheat and corn and Arabidopsis, obviously. And so with that, uh, um, we then can now identify what are the real phosphatases, for example, and kinases in soybean, for which they're not fully well annotated. And our network, causal network, are now more precise. And so all of this is uh, established is, uh, again, you have a part that is an encoder, a part that is the uh, decoder, and here are the data in the black box that we're trying to understand. Um, and so we can use it as a prediction and we we are we do always use Arabidopsis as a way to, for example, given some data and given what we think are the most important parameter, how we can uh, predict the height of the hypo, uh, of the hypocotyl of Arabidopsis at two different temperatures. For the co-functional, mm -hmm. do you use uh, just one layer of molecular data, just genes or just proteins? You, you use mm -hmm. all together. That's... So for the co-function, we use uh, anything that is in, oh, any, any information that comes from both gene expression as well as the PFAM. PFAM is the database of all of the different protein in all the different species. So we use uh, about a thousand family information from the PFAM and all of our gene expression. And so, and so that going into uh, by using this neural network, now we work with Lucia and Max, uh, and we try to identify one of the major gap in uh, um, IDR, so disorder region, is that you cannot predict, and so is uh, using the neural network to predict uh, the sequence of these uh, um, disorder regions so that you can synthetically code them. And those are important. For example, forever studies are on uh, the little bug, I don't know the name, that is able to go through cycle of uh, desiccation and then you put a drop of water. Tardigrade, yeah. Yeah, that one. Say it aloud. I'm gonna put the name like tardigrade. Yeah, tardigrade. Yes, awesome. And so they are based on IDR sequence. And so identify the IDR sequence. And for example, you can put it now if you want to go through cycle of uh, uh, preservation without uh, cold. So for example, for blood or for plants, if you were to send Again, plants to Mars, you don't want to use a refrigerator, but you send the right cells to Mars, essicate it, and then you de-essicate them on the 3D bioprinter, you print them there, and then you, well, you need to have a sci-fi vision, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so this is how the, the neural network works. It looks at every uh, five amino acid or so, and looks at all of the different uh, so all of these different sequence feature and understand what is the most important sequence feature to then uh, uh, map it back with the transcriptomic domain. And the beautiful things is that uh, what Lucia is doing is taking all of the 2000 transcription factor of Arabidopsis, clone it, and then uh, with a system of yeast where if it's an activator, it can turn uh, the marker line green. So then now you have a validation of the network predicts the sequence to be an activator, and then you have the data from the east of the transcription factor of Arabidopsis. And so with that, uh, I think I'll just say the name of uh, the steps. Uh, so Jacob is the director of steps and the Codepity director. We are in North Carolina. We welcome all of you in the new building that is the Plant Science Building. Um, we work on phosphorus sustainability 
you know why, but our uh, intention is to reduce 25% reduction of human dependence from phosphate mine and the 25% that is lost to the environment in 25 years. And so we call these affectionately the 25 in 25 vision. And uh, what we work on is materials that allow to decompose uh, the organic phosphorus that is in the soil um, from uh, surface water, animal manure, as well as human urine, because it's very concentrated. You practically have 50% of the phosphorus that is just lost through uh, urine. These are what we're doing. So we, we do a lot of material formation, uh, material engineers, and then we do a lot of uh, uh, human technology scales. So for example, where plants come in place. These are typical projects that are funded by STEPS. Um, and in particular, we were talking about, uh, I'm missing the person I was talking to, but practically uh, sensor and uh, sp um, microfluidics device that allow us to quantify the intake and uh, uh, um, efflux of uh, phosphorus into the root, and then do a lot of uh, hydrogen phenotyping with corn. And that's it. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's where we are currently living in the plant science building and uh, STEPS is part of the PSI, the Plant Science Initiative. As uh, Chris was saying, I'm the director for the plant improvement. So we looked into releasing new plant variety, microbiome, crop strap, crop strap protection. STEPS is also part of this resilient agricultural system with there is um, environmental sustainability. And uh, that's it, I'd say. These are all the work that we have done, and these are, oh, it's coming very wrong, but these are the people that uh, is the class. Uh, it was up to four years, last year, but I added an extra year because we're already in February. And with that, sorry, it's 12, but I have a few more questions if you want. In the minutes. Yeah. Is there any questions? Anybody online have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so very, very, very interesting talk, very expensive talk. Uh, so the question I have is when you are talking about um, stem cells, within the stem cells, you have different cells in different state. Even within the uh, stem cells, they are diverse. They are not mm -hmm. the same type. Correct. And you're talking about 70% of the genes that are conserved. Mm -hmm. So 30% are unique to the each cell. Correct. Uh, what are your thoughts on the stoichiometry of the shared genes or the conserved genes hmm. defining their um, identity versus uh, the unique genes? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. And I don't have an answer. We looked from the perspective, the other perspective. So we looked from the perspective of knowing that 30% are specific to each of the different uh, stem cell identity. So one is a cortex and the dermis initial will go uh, through an asymmetric cell division to form two cell type and et cetera. One is a uh, columnar stem cell. It goes through a symmetric division so that then the daughter becomes differentiated. So you have different mo molecular mechanism. What we were looking were at the how the transcription factor and the protein stoichiometry is causal of either an asymmetric cell division where two cells take two completely different fate versus uh, a symmetric division where the stem cell just divides to regenerate itself and divides to generate the daughter cell that has a function. We were not looking at the uh, what and whether the stoichiometry of the every present genes uh, is in any way affecting that. That's an excellent question. I don't know an answer. It's the circumstance between the transcription factor and its targets. Uh, is, uh, is between um, not the transcription factor. You can think about the transcription factor is target, but it's more transcription factor A and transcription factor B getting together to bound to a target uh, 
we don't know what is the target, but is how is the stoichiometry of these two transcription factor then changing whether they can regulate one target or not? Yeah. So that's a good perspective. We, we just ignore the 70% because it's like too many, but that's a. Uh, I had a quick question. So on the, probably get this a oh, lot okay. of like class part, but right, like, do you think. Ah, the 3D by the printing. Yeah, like <laughs> on, the, on the end of like differentiation, do you think there's any mechano cues that like are being missed yeah. by not having a cell wall? Oh, no. So the cell wall is reformed. Okay. okay. So that's an excellent question. So. Uh, the question is, uh, is are you in any way positively or negatively affecting this uh, protoplast regeneration? So what, did I, what I did not say um, is that as part of setting up the whole 3D bioprinting, we had to spend a lot of time to look at uh, when the cell wall was regenerating. Yeah. And so there are uh, either calcophore or another stain and within six hours, unless you inhibit that process, I within see. six hours, the protoplasts start to reform the cell. The problem there is, I'll give you the clue for a question. The problem is that so far, yeah. uh, when you have a protoplast and uh, the cell wall is regenerating, the, that is now a cell. Within 24 hours, you have your own cell back. Um, it divides, so it forms, it divides, so it forms a clone. Yeah. You have that the primary plasmodesmata is reestablished. So from Ken Bernabeu, we have all of the lineage uh, markers. So that means that when they divide, uh, do they maintain their identity? Is the plasmodesmata, so the uh, trafficking, allowing for cell communication reestablished? Yes. Then it divides again. Great, is again there. The problem that we're having is if you want to put two cells, and that's my dream to go to Mars, if you want to put two different cells and have them re-communicating in terms of uh, re-establish a plasma dysmata communication, we cannot do that. That's it. So there are mechanisms by which you can do secondary plasma dysmata induction so that you could take cell A and cell B put them in the same environment uh, and uh, have them reestablish a communication without division, but we cannot yet. Yeah. So we can do cell type lineages, so we can do all of the cell to cell communication fundamental science that will bring us to Mars, but we cannot do that for um, yet for the cell to cell communication aspect. So we can do plant regeneration, they don't care, mm. but you cannot do cell to cell molecular mechanism. I see. Yeah. Okay. So it's not a cell wall. It, it is a cell wall. The problem, if you were to fuse them, maybe then you have a fused protoplast. Right. But outside the cellular lineage, you cannot reestablish plasma desmata connectivity. And so that means that you depend only on diffusible signal which we know is not the sole things that allows for cell. Yeah. Okay, with that, um, let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah.